three minutes. Wow. All right, we're going to pick up in Acts 5. So put on your seatbelts because it starts off to us a little rough, but that's okay. All right, Acts chapter 5. So up until this point, I think something cool to realize is that from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, I don't know if we've, we've realized this, but it actually jumps around. Like it actually shows you what's going on in the church, then it shows you back to how they're witnessing to the non-believers, then it goes back to the church, then it goes back. So it's kind of like giving you insight, what's going on with the church, what's going on with the ministry, and it, it literally goes back and forth, and I thought that's cool. And where Tony left off last week was that what? The believers shared all their possessions, right? And it ended with Barnabas selling a land of his and giving it and laying it at the apostles' feet. So we pick up with verse 1. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. All right, so here we have Ananias, right? And it says, together with his wife. So his wife is there, and they sell a piece of property, right? Falling in line with what's going on. Verse 2, with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. So, we see off the, off the bat, he does this with his wife's full knowledge, right? So she is not exempt from what's about to happen. She knew, and it also says that he kept back part of the money for himself. So, we go on to verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? So Peter right away addresses the fact that he knows what Ananias did, right? We have a lot to tackle with this one verse alone. We'll go right into Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? Now, I'm going to be honest with y'all. I, I've been on my face this week battling this verse because I've read this chapter many times, and I've never really looked at this verse and understood what that's saying. And to a certain extent, I still don't understand what that's saying. When you look up the word fill, it's the same word, <laughs> fill. So he filled his heart. Now, the word heart, if you look on the screen in Greek, is cardia, right? The center and seat of spiritual life, the soul or mind, as it is the fountain and seat of the thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, endeavors. So it's not the spirit. It's not the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, remember, when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, our dead spirit comes alive because the spirit of Christ is in us. Amen? But something happens here where Satan, or demons, but it says Satan, fills Ananias' heart. How can that be? Right? Now, when you read on, it says that so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? It means that Ananias has the Holy Spirit. So, you have a believer here amongst other believers who has the Holy Spirit. The Bible gives us context to the fact that he lied to the Holy Spirit. But his, yet his heart was filled with Satan. So what does, this, what does this show us? What can we pull from this in being honest to the word of God? Well, it shows us that something have, there's something that can happen with us, even as believers, people who have the Holy Spirit, that we can give into and I'm trying to be very careful with my words to any kind of spiritual realm that falls under the category of Satan and, and, and demonic motives or influence or whatever you want to call it. I, want, I don't want to say a specific word because when you study the word of God, it's not so clear. But something happens with Ananias where he allows this to happen. He says, and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. 
So Ananias keeps the money that he sold for himself. Let's read verse 4. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? So Peter says, you sold this property. This, it was your money to begin with, right? You could have did with the money whatever you wanted, and you would have been justified in doing it. Why? Because it was your money, right? So, so what does this show us? Okay, we know that he lies, right? Do we know why he lies? Not really. We don't really know why Ananias lied, right? It could be because he saw the other apostle or he saw Barnabas sell land, so he wanted to do it. Maybe he thought it was the right thing to do. Maybe he really wanted to give all the money, but maybe he had some debt, so he was like, I'll keep some. We don't really know, right? Now, let me ask you another question that I can't answer. You like that? I'm going to ask you a question I can't answer. How did Peter know that he lied? Does it say that? Does it say how Peter knows? I've heard a lot of people say, oh, Peter had discernment. Could be. Doesn't say it. Right? Could be discernment. It could be that somebody actually told him. Who knows? Maybe somebody saw the transaction and saw him keep it. Right? We don't know how Peter knows. And there's something that I want to extract from that. I've I don't think I've given too many keys when I preach, but I'm going to give you a key right now. This is huge when you read the Word of God, right? You ready? Nope, you can skip that. I'm sorry. Key. When reading the Word of God, let the mysteries remain mysteries and stick with the facts. And let me tell you something. When you read the Word of God, it's a lot of mysteries. <laughs> it's a whole lot of mysteries. Well, why did this happen? How did this happen? We don't know. But if you want to stay honest to God and to yourself, let the mysteries remain mysteries and let the facts remain facts. Okay. So we go back to the text. Verse 4. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. So again, Gives us context. Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, right? He didn't just lie to humans, but he lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that lying is wrong, right? I think everybody in here knows that, amen? Isn't that a commandment somewhere? Where is that found in? That's found in the Ten Commandments, amen? Y'all scared me for a second, Right? Again, we don't know the purpose of why he lied, but I want to go to the scripture that they skipped. It's in Romans 14. It says, you may believe there's nothing wrong with what you, oh, I'm sorry, go back. I think there's one more slide before that. Is it broken down into two slides? Yeah, so go, go back. Is this the only one? Okay. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. Right? So, but if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it, for you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. So why am I bringing this verse up, right? Well, we don't, again, we don't know why Ananias did what he did, but I do want to extract a principle for what, a reason could have been of why he's doing it, and that's this. Ananias could have known in his head that what he was doing was wrong. I would like to believe, and again, this is just me speaking, that he possibly did. Why? The Bible says he has the Holy Spirit, right? How many of us know that when we do something wrong, at least I speak for myself, I have conviction, <laughs> right? You argue with somebody, you, you, you react the wrong way. And then right away, the Holy Spirit convicts us, right? So what Paul in Romans is talking about in chapter 14, he's talking about um, causing others to stumble. And in this specific chapter, he's talking about eating. That's the example he uses to, extract, to make a principle known, which is the principle being that if you do anything, right, in this walk, you're walking with God and you make decisions or you do things, and you are not convinced in your mind of why you're doing what you're doing, you are sinning. 
Why? Because of that last verse. If you do anything you believe is not right. In some translations it says, if you do anything that's not from faith, you are sinning. So what does that mean? When we move throughout life, right, you could be dropping offering in the basket, right? But if you have doubts, well, maybe this is too much or maybe I shouldn't give, that's not right. God wants you to do everything from a, a vantage point of faith. And we're going to see why that's important here. Ready? Verse 5. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. All right. Did he get hurt? No. Did he break a leg? What happened? He died. No breath. Dead. On the spot. I mean, can you imagine that? And then here's the next line. And great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, carried him out, and buried him. <laughs> they got right to it. No funeral. No remembering in eyes, dead, buried, gone. That's crazy. I, I read that and was like, that's crazy. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Okay, so time has passed, right? Three hours to be exact. It's a long time. Wife comes in, wife, unaware of what happened, right? It says, Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? So let me, let me pause right there. This is God's mercy, right? If God could have, when Peter approached him, dropped both of them at that time. Boom, both of them dead, gone. He allowed his wife to have a chance, right? Peter questions her. She says, yes. She said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire? Conspire meaning together come up with this plan, right? To test the spirit of the Lord. Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. So she also what? Died. Yeah, she died. She didn't pass out and then get resuscitated. She died. So, men, where are the men at? Where are the husbands at? Raise your hand. Husbands, right? You guys, and myself included, see the ring? Have an undeniable sacred calling. At the beginning of this chapter, it says that with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, right? Ananias led his wife in this decision. Maybe, maybe Sapphira didn't want to do it. And maybe she was just submitting. Maybe she wanted to do it. We don't know. However, we know that men, he led and he made this decision. Right? And what I want to say is, is that your decisions are going to affect your family. Whether you like it or not. But I'll move on from you and say, ladies... She had a chance to make this right. And we're going to see later on in this, in this passage, on, in chapter 5, why it's important that you obey God and not human beings. Now, it's a lot more tricky for you as ladies. Why? Because you guys have a calling different from men to submit to your husbands, right? So it makes things tricky, right? Like, when do you submit? When do you not submit? Well, it takes you being close to God. Guess what your husband can't do? He can't keep you from God, right? right? And if your husband's not along with the page, he's not getting the program, get with the program. Because if you're not with the program, God is going to judge all of us separately. And this is a story that completely shows that. So ladies, at all costs, please follow God and believe that your husband is going to come along. Amen? All right, so we have a crazy scene here. Y'all are quiet. I believe the people in this day were quiet because this is a difficult passage, right? Sin enters the church. These people drop dead. Let's pick it up. Verse 10. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. 
Then the young men came in. I hope they was paying these men because they working hard this day. And finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear. Okay, before I even read that, if there's a verse that I want everybody to meditate on this week, it's this next verse. If you're asking, well, why did that happen? Why did it happen to them and, and it didn't happen to nobody else? Why doesn't that happen today? Why doesn't God strike people dead when, he, when something happens in his church? Right? Those things I can't answer for you. What I can say is verse 11, the first six verses, is something we should all meditate on this week. Great fear sees the whole church. I'm going to read it again. Great fear sees the whole church. In a day where everybody thinks everything is giggly and cuddly and loving, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And while he is completely loving, he is completely just. And that's a key for our lives, right? Fearing the Lord. Now, the word for fear here is not terrified fear in the sense that it leaves you stagnant. No, it's a fear that actually one of the synonyms is awe, A-W-E, which is like an amazement. But before that word, it says a rever. I don't even know how to say this word, like a reverence type of a fear. I don't know, reverential. I don't know, that's a word I made up. But you get what I'm trying to say, reverence. It was a reverence all where you had respect for this person and you fear this person, but it's a good fear. Kind of like how some of us fear our fathers, right? Our fathers, when they lay the law down or when they, you know, smack us upside the head. It's, it's, it's that kind of a fear. It's a good fear. It should be. Great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about these events. So it didn't just seize the church, it sees all those outside of the church. People understood and knew what the God of the Jews did. He struck his people down. Now, if you ask me, right, seriously, what's a good evangelism tool? Right? If I asked you right now, what would we went out, if I said we're going to stop service, we're going to go out in the Pensacola, we're going to evangelize the people, knock on doors, right? What would you say is some good things that we should do? A lot of you would say share the word, share the truth. A lot of you would say, you know, love on the people. You know, maybe we cut their grass, do something like that. Would you say going out and handling church business among each other and then somebody dying is a good witness tool? Would you say that? I'm, I'm asking you. I want to pick at your brain and what you think would be right or wrong. You think somebody dropping dead amongst the brethren and sisters is a good witnessing tool, yes or no? No. I would not. No. <laughs> I don't want to see any of you die among me, right? But God allowed two of his followers to drop dead. Wow. Right? Let's move on. Let's get to the good parts because I feel like y'all are quiet. Even though that's good, all scripture is good. And we're going to learn why. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. All right, so we don't really see a time lapse here. We don't know how long. Maybe it's the same day. Maybe it's two days. Maybe it's a week. Maybe the church had some things to get over after seeing what they just saw. Who knows? But all we know is that it picks up by saying the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Okay, that, that verse kind of messed me up a little bit, right? Because it says, nobody from the outside came to the church to join them, right? Yet, they were highly regarded by all the people. So, there was something in the unbelievers that, that the believers, they looked to and said, ah, oh, their life, there's... These are, these are people that are worthy of honor. You know, they're, they're, they have good, they have integrity, whatever you want to say. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't go and dare be with them. So there was something going on, right? But it says in verse 14, I love it. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So although that was happening, people were still being saved. So God was still moving. Right? And then it says, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets 
and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. So because, so it says, verse 15 starts off and says, as a result, right? A result of what? The people who believe. So as people came in, more and more people from the outside and even probably the believers brought people that were sick. And this says, it says also that they brought people who were possessed or tormented by impure spirits. We'll get to that in a second. They laid them there as an act of faith. You're not going to do that unless you believe something can happen. And they, they were down for Peter's shadow to even fall, right? Verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem. So more and more people, not just people in Jerusalem, but outside, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits. Okay. So a lot of times we see in Scripture with Jesus in the Gospels that people with impure spirits were not healthy. Things were happening to them. They were being thrown around. They were convulsing all kinds of stuff. But it specifically says here that the sick came and also impure spirits. When the Bible talks about impure spirits, right, those two words join together. There's a lot of times the Bible talks about that. With Jesus and the Gospels and some of the epistles. When it talks about that, this is what it means, right? A spirit that's a little higher in authority than humans, but lower than God. So what does that tell us? We have no power over these things. If anything, they have power over us, apart from the Holy Spirit as humans. I'm just talking strictly human speaking, right? But of course, they're under God. So these are the type of spirits that were tormenting people. And look how it ends. It says, and all of them were healed. How many? All. All. All of them were healed. This is amazing, right? This was the same thing what happened when Jesus was here. Jesus would be preaching, he would be doing miracles, and everybody would be healed. Even the people who didn't really fully commit to him, right? And we don't know what happens to their lives because the scripture doesn't tell us. Maybe they were healed, and then maybe they got sick again. Maybe they were healed, maybe, maybe they got tormented again. We don't know. But we know as God was moving, everybody was healed. God, there were some amazing things happening at the conception of the church, right? And God was honoring all of those things. Let's, let's remember what Jesus said in Acts 1 we read weeks ago. Jesus said, you're going to go into Judea and to Samaria and to all the world, right? And you're going to be my witnesses. Well, God is the one creating all of this. And like I said, People dropping dead, people getting healed, and it says that people from outside of Jerusalem were bringing their people in. So we see that as these things were happening, it was catching the attention of people around Jerusalem. God was honoring his word. What do we, I think we talked about it on Wednesday, how we can have short-term memory with God. Even in reading the scripture, we don't understand how even in this, as, as we start to see scripture, people are being brought in from the outside. God is fulfilling his promise in Acts 1. And we overlook these things, but God is faithful to his own word. Amen? All right. So now we're at verse 17. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Who were the Sadducees? The, the Sadducees are always coupled with the Pharisees in Scripture. Not always, but usually. But they're actually very distinct. They're not the same people. The Pharisees were people who were studied in the law, people who were, uh, were Jews, but they believed in angels and demons. They believed in God. They believed in power. They believed in everything we believe in, of course, with the exclusion that Jesus was God. But they believed in all of that, right? And the Pharisees were also people who were more relational with the people. So just imagine, Pharisees today, if the concept was still around, which it kind of is, would, they would be among us. They would be at our church. They'd be at another church. They were more relational. Sadducees were people who were more 
in line and equipped with, like, the government, you could say. They were, they were cool with the Romans and with the emperor. They were kind of disconnected from the people, right? So why is this important? The Sadducees did not believe in the power of God, right? I'm going to go. I don't think it's Acts 23 is not on the screen, is it? It's not. It's okay. I have it in my Bible. Acts 23, 7 to 8. This chapter, we're going to get there weeks from now. But this is when Paul is locked up. He's before court, and he has to present his case. And every time they met, it was always Sadducees and Pharisees at these court settings. So it was always these, this political party that was mixed with people who believed in the spiritual and people who didn't. Nonetheless, they were part of the same party. So in this setting, Paul's in front of both of them. And look at what the word says in Acts 23, 7 to 8. When he said this, Paul, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. In parentheses, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believed all these things. Okay, so getting back to the text, the Sadducees, these are people who are way off. These are heretics if you would use that word to describe anybody, heretical, right? So these are the people now that we're dealing with in this chapter. It says, then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party and the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. So they were jealous. What were they jealous of? Well, there's a lot of context clues as we start to read, but they were jealous nonetheless. Verse 18, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Okay, do we believe this? So the apostles, doing God's work, Sadducees, yo, let me holler at you, come here. Boom, put them in jail. They're in jail. We don't know what they went through. But at night, an angel comes and opens the doors. Hallelujah. That's amazing, right? And that happens with the command that follows. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. Now, new life meaning resurrection. This is specifically talking about post-resurrection. Now that you have the Holy Spirit, now that Jesus rose, go tell the people about that, right? The angel also says, go stand in the temple courts. Can you bring the picture up? We read in verse 12 that they were meeting in Solomon's colony, right? Now, this is a great picture to kind of show you what that looks like. Uh, when you look at, you see this wall right here? Let me go. Let me go. You see the wall right there? That's, that's where they would meet, right? It was more personal. When you look at eight that big opening inside and even on the other side, those are the temple courts, right? So at first, they were ministering in this 11th section. And remember, the believers were there. It was only the believers. Nobody from the outside would join them. But now the angel is saying, go to, eight, go to the temple courts and, and preach, right, and teach. So when we get back to the scripture, it says, at daybreak, stop right there. All right, I'm so mad that the text doesn't give you a timetable of when this happened. Because it doesn't say that this happened concurrently after the apostles healed many, which happened right after Ananias and Sapphira got dead. Because that's a lot of work. That's a lot going on in one day. All we know is, is that the apostles were doing their thing, and they got locked up. And they were in a public jail. Now, our jails are crazy. The jails back in the day, huh, a lot more dirty, a lot more crazy things going on. And they were in jail during the night. But an angel opens the door and tells them to tell the people about this new life. And at daybreak, they went. You know what daybreak means? As soon as the sun rose. No rest for the weary. <laughs> These men... But I'm just saying, think about that. 
They didn't say, yo, let me go get my tea, let me rest, you know, let me do my thing first, and then I'll go. They obeyed. They went right away. It says, at daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach. Teach. Big difference. Those of you who came on the mission trip, right, we went over Acts 17 one time, and we talked about how, how we need sometimes to teach people, right? We always think that the gospel is sharing just the gospel, or sometimes we think that the gospel is letting our lives speak, and those are all, you know, part of it. But sometimes you need to teach people. You need to sit down with somebody and explain to them the gospel. We miss that in Acts. A lot of times, people did not just preach and that was it. A lot of times, the apostles taught people. So if you're asking, well, what does that mean, they taught people? Well, remember, Jews who were not yet Christians still believed in the Messiah that one day he was come. They totally didn't get that Jesus was that God. So they still were familiar with the law. They were familiar with all the things that a B.C. or before era Christian would have known. They knew everything. The apostles would step on the scene and teach people. They would go to people and let's say they would sit down and explain to them why Jesus was the Messiah. They might pull out Old Testament prophecies and see, remember it said this? Jesus was that person. Don't you know? In so many letters where Paul says, Paul persuaded people. So when the angel released them and they went into the temple courts, they began to teach the people. That's how it ends. You know what the people, the people in Greek is like laos or something like that. Some weird funky word, right? It's Greek, so I don't know. I'm sorry. But it says the people. It's the same verbiage used in verses 13. If you go back to verse 13, again, remember who it's addressing. No one else dare join them even though they were highly regarded by what? The people. So when it says this, it's talking about non-believers. So again, Solomon's colonnade, they're meeting with believers. You go to the temple court. They're meeting with non-believers, and they're teaching them. When the high priest, verse 21, and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin. That's, that's the, the, the high, I don't know, that's like court, right? If we go to court today, that's where the Sadducees and the Pharisees would meet, at the Sanhedrin. The full assembly of all the elders of Israel and sent to the jail for the apostles. So these men at this time are still unaware that they out. They've been out. They're teaching. Can't hold them back, right? But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked. With the guards standing at the doors, everything seems right. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. So to me, clearly, they have to have had a deep prison cell if they had to actually go in and check inside. Maybe they could have been hiding behind a wall or something. But it says they were not inside. On hearing this report, verse 24, the captain of the temple guard and the chief's priests were at a loss. Sounds, God bless you, X. It sounds about right to me, right, that they were at a loss. Sounds about right. I think that would be all of our... Uh, reactions, but look at what it says next. Wondering what this might lead to. Okay. I'm not saying what I would have done because God has put us here. Acts 17 says we live at this time for a specific moment. Praise be to God. It's our greatest chance of knowing God. I'm so for that, right? But I would think that in this time, my reaction would not be, what does it say? Oh, what it might lead to. I think my reaction would be, how the heck did these men get out of jail? Right? That would definitely be my response. And then what would happen? Right? Because we're, we, as humans, we love to try to figure things out. I would be like, okay, well, the guard was there. They don't have security footage, by the way. But the guard was there, and those guards did not leave their, their post. Trust me. It's not like here you go get some Chipotle on your break. No. They never left their post. So... The guards was there. We didn't hear any ruckus. So, wow, maybe, maybe. At least they could have ended with, maybe God is with these men. No. Their immediate response was wondering what this might lead to. 
I just want to say, like, and God help me, like, we, we have to stop, and we're going to see as we continue to read, we have to stop trying to assume things or figure things out. One of the things I love about God, even though I love it, I kind of, it, it troubles my heart on the inside at times because I, I understand that I'm not always like this. As a matter of fact, a lot of the times I'm not like this. But one of the beautiful things about following the Lord is he wants us to come to him like a child in everything. Meaning we resolve to know nothing about our lives. We resolve to know nothing about decisions. Even if we had a past experience and God moved in that way, it doesn't mean he wants to move the same way this time. All these things, God says, come to me like a child. I'm going to guide you, right? But we have, we have a problem. We try to figure things out. We go ahead of God. Well, if I do this, that's what this means. Or if we don't do this, that's what this doesn't mean. Or people could react like this. Or if I say this, they might. Our sole purpose in life should be what Galatians says. Walk in the spirit. What does that, what does that mean practically? That means that day by day, moment by moment, being in a one relationship with the Holy Spirit, to say in every decision, and everything I do, God, what do you want me to do? But we don't do that. We go off of experience. We go off of what is familiar. We go off of what is comfortable. We're all guilty of that. And I've been finding this week, right, I, I once heard, I don't know who said this, but I love this line. Reactions, right, that we give, reactions, are windows to our heart. How we react to things are usually a reflection of our heart. And I'm just finding as I was reading this week, bro, I'm broken, bro. I fail a lot. And even when we meet in our business meeting today, I, I fail. I fail miserably at walking in the spirit, my reactions to things. So I just want to say before we move on, and we're going to see this a lot more, is that we have to stop trying to figure things out. Verse 25. Then someone come and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because what? Because they feared that the people would stone them. I, I, I can't spend too much time on that alone either. But they were fearful that the people would stone them. It doesn't really specifically say why they thought the people would stone them. So we, you know, we can kind of extract some things and break that down. Okay, why, why did they fear that? Maybe they thought, well, everything that's happening has to be true, and we killed this man, so we need to make sure we tiptoe. That's denying the truth. That's, that's so deceptive. It could be that. It could be that they were, I don't know, they were upset, maybe still jealous. There's a few things that it could be, but the point is they weren't in their right minds of thinking. They were obsessed with themselves, whether it was their image, whether it was their power of authority. It doesn't matter what it is. They understood that if they took the people, the people would react a certain way. And didn't, they didn't even bother to think if it was right or not. Again, I don't want to be hung up on that, but just think about that. Verse 27, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin. So now they're all lined up. I don't know how this works. You know, I don't know if they're sitting high or whatever, but they're, they're in front of all these people, all these religious leaders, right? And it says, we gave you, in verse 28, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. So you could teach, but don't teach in this name. He said, yet, and this is where the context clues kind of really give us, they're so concerned about themselves. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Well, you are guilty of his blood. <laughs> You killed him. You conspired against him. Do you see how irrational these men are thinking? The very men. First of all, just at least own what you did. You did kill him. But they can't even see that. 
Do you see what happens with deception? Think about Pharaoh in Egypt with Moses. All the things and all the plagues that happened, that man still did not get it. Okay, that's a huge key, right? There's something to be said about human nature. Even in the beginning of this chapter, we read, Ananias had his heart filled with Satan. Yo, we can get to a place in our lives where we think we're so right or things are so okay and be so off. It's a scary thing. And these Sadducees, or these, yes, yeah, Sadducees are really showing us this. Peter and the apostles reply, I, lo- I, I love this part. We must obey God rather than human beings. Again, ladies, remember, obey God. Men, obey God. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed. (laughs) I'll stop right there. All right. So Peter is going now. I don't know if you're noticing it. Sorry. But he's sharing the gospel. Now, He's not explaining who Jesus is because they know who Jesus is, right? Today we have to do that. So he picks up at the gospel where they killed him, right? But I love what he says. He doesn't shy away from the what? The truth. He says, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom you killed. If you go to what Tony read in Acts 4, he did the same thing. Where is it at? I want to read it. Sorry. But they were astonished. Uh, okay, here we go. Verse 9 in chapter 4. If we are being called to, count to, uh, to account today for an act of kindness that is shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Twice. He did not shy away from the truth of what they did. So what does this teach us? No matter how loving you want to be to somebody, if you are not sharing the truth, the truth, I don't know what that means, but it's not a good one, and it's not God. I'm not going to go into the details, but remember, this is key for us. They were standing before the highest of the highest men. They had the authority in that moment to kill them. Think about that. And they, they said something that they probably took as disrespectful. Because they already mentioned, you're trying to make us guilty of this blood. And indirectly, he says, you are. Because he says, you killed him. And this is the second time. He's testing his, what the world would say, he's testing his luck. Right? All right, back to the scriptures. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. Whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him. Lifted him up to his own right hand, as and we sang about it today, as prince and savior. Or another word for savior is deliverer. He has delivered us. That he might bring Israel to what? To repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. There is so much to unpack here. So I'm going to try to hurry up and do it. Number one. Peter says, he, Jesus did that, that he might bring Israel to repentance. So remember, the Gentiles are not included, meaning everybody who's not a Jew. Not included yet, but we know he came to deliver all of us. But look at what he says. To bring Israel to repentance. Does he say belief? No, he does not say belief. He says repentance. There is a popular preaching today that says belief Unbelief sends you to hell. That's false. That is false doctrine. Why? James 2.19. Let's go there. If I could find it. Hebrews and James, right? Am I tripping? All right, here we go. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe That there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So what does that mean? Okay. You can believe and not have repentance. That's possible. You can believe in God intellectually. You can say it all you want. 
It's no good to you. He actually says after that, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? So belief is useless by itself. It's not until you do something with your faith that matters. So going back, he says, repent to bring to repentance and forgive their sins. So what does repent mean? Oh, before I move on to that, I know I said the first, that you can believe but not have repentance, but guess what? You can't have repentance without belief because true repentance means you are making a conscious decision to turn from the way you used to live to now say, I'm wrong, what I used to do was horrendous, and I'm going to follow God. That, in order to do that, you have to believe. You can't do that without believing. So you can have Belief without repentance, but you can't have repentance without belief. And this actually, when we go to verse 32, it says, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. What's the first obedient thing you do when you come to God? Repent. Yes, amen. That's the first thing you do is repent. Let's look at the word repent. Key, to change one's mind for the better heartily to amend the abhorrence of one past sins. That's a big word, so I broke that word down. To regard with extreme repugnance, that's what appearance means, a strong dislike or distaste, to feel, I love this next line, to feel hatred or loathing, loathing meaning to dislike greatly and often with disgust, so I broke it all together, and repent, to change one's mind for the better, Heartily to a man with an extreme, an extreme. Not just that I put up with it. It's an extreme dislike, distaste, hatred, and disgust of one's past sins. It is not a sorry to God. It's not just saying sorry. I'm so guilty of that. And that's sometimes why I get in that psychological state where I don't want to pray again because I've already prayed about the same thing 10 times, but I haven't changed. So if I go to God this time and I say the same thing and I don't change, then I'm just a hypocrite. And that can keep me away from God. But I know that his grace is greater. But true repentance, I know when I truly repent. You want to know how? I stop doing it. That's when I truly repent. Amen? But God's grace is so, like Tony said, God's grace is so big. Because when we don't deserve it, which is every day, almost every moment of every day, when we don't deserve it, he still extends it to us and allows us to repent and move forward. Amen. So he's saying this to the sin. Now, <laughs> I'm saying this to y'all as believers, right? Y'all with me, right? Amen. We repent. It's good. Repentance is good. He's saying this to a bunch of religious men, void of the spirit, could die at any moment. I just want to say it. Setting the scene again, right? We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Key verse. Why would Peter say to these men, we are witnesses of these things? Like, as a believer to believer, I don't have to tell you the Holy Spirit is inside of me. You know that, because I claim to be a believer. Well, you don't know that, but you believe that, that the Holy Spirit is inside of me. So when I talk to you, I say, I really believe, Liz, that God, you know, I don't, don't, don't hold me to this, but I believe you, you should be encouraged today because, you know, God wants to say he's pleased with you. I don't know. I might have a word for you, right? I don't have to say God who's with me, Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, says this, right? But he says that here. Why? Why? These men don't even believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in spiritual things. So why would he say that? Peter knew who he was speaking to. He's... To, again, this is an assumption, so let me, I hate assumptions, but sometimes you have to do it, and it just helps us, but I believe that this is still in line with the word of God. I believe with all my heart, Peter knew his audience. When you read all of scripture, that's Acts 17, we talked about that already when we went to missions. Peter, or Paul knew his audience. When he talked to the Stoics and the Epicureans, he looked around, he knew their gods that they worshipped. He did all that because he cared, by the way. He really loved God. He really loved people, so he cared enough to study that. But the point is, Paul knew and Peter knew. Peter knows his audience. So he's trying to make them probably hungry. 
We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Spirit, the Spirit of God who lives inside of me. Look, it may seem harsh what he's sharing, but really he's sharing the gospel. He's trying to get through to these hard-headed, hard-hearted men with the gospel at all costs, because, again, he could die. All right, let's move on. When they heard this, they were furious. But they didn't respond in the right way, clearly. And wanted to put them to death, which they could have. But a Pharisee, oh, so now we're switching from the Sadducee to the Pharisee. Big difference now. Now you got somebody who believes in spiritual things. Now you have somebody who actually believes everything they believe except in Jesus. So this man is a little bit more equipped. Named, I'm sorry, verse 34, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. I don't even know if that's right. I always say someone with a Spanish accent. A teacher of the law who was honored by all his people stood up in the, his, in the Sanhedrin. All right. That's key. This man who stood up was a man that, same word, laus, the people. So the people, both Jews and Christians and also non-believers, he was honored by them. That's huge. So this is somebody that actually had some juice, some authority, some people liked this guy, or at least respected him, right? He's the one that gets up, and he says, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, I don't even know how to say his name, Theodos, Theodore, <laughs> appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men railed to him. He was killed. All of his followers are dis dispersed. And it all came to nothing. After him, Judas, the Galilean, appeared in the days of the census, and that a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, this man, Rico Suave, he got all the answers, right? Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it'll fail. But, mind you, this is a man who's speaking that believes in spiritual things. If anything, God is using them because his purpose with the apostles was not finished yet. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Wow. And it actually says that his speech persuaded them. So they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Okay, they didn't actually have them flogged the same way Jesus did, where Jesus was tied to a pole and he had the, the lacerations with the whip. That, that's not the same one. They just got beat. I mean, not just. <laughs> they did not just get beat. But I'm just saying, it's different. They didn't get the same treatment Jesus did. But still, nonetheless, they got beat. Then they ordered them not to speak. These dudes is the most hard-headed guys ever. Not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Before I move on to the last two or three verses, in verse 39, even as somebody, even, even as a Pharisee, this man still doesn't get it. Why? Because he says, if it's from human origin, it'll fail. If not, but y'all haven't seen enough? You, like, everything that's happened in the name of Jesus, yet you still don't believe? What does this say to us? What can we learn from this? Even if we see certain things, it does not mean that we will truly believe. Right? Right? What is God saying in that? There's so many verses in the, in the Gospels. Jesus talks about that. He talks about Lazarus who went to hell and he tries to tell his family. He's like, yo, they're not going to listen to your family, even if they see what happens, if they're not listening to the prophets. Why, though? Why? What is the point of all of that? That even if we see something, even if, even if a non-believer right now came into this place and some of you who are struggling with your faith, or maybe not really walking with God at all. And somebody came in and I prayed over them. And a demon manifests. Or forget the demon. Let's say this dude was crippled. And y'all all knew him just like the man at the beautiful gate. And I prayed. And he got up and walked out of here. Do we understand that some of us in this room still would not believe? You still would not follow God? Th that's crazy to me. But why? Why is it that way? Why, is, why are we like that as humans? Here's why. Our hearts. It's all about our hearts. Our faith, our hearts. 
And the only people that have access to God Almighty, that is the only one capable of knowing and changing the human heart, the only way you have access is humility. That's the only way. The only way. You will not get to God any other way, even if you force it. So let this man, let this Pharisee be, Pharisee be an example to us. That it's not about what we need to do. It's not about what we need to see. It's about getting on our knees in private, getting before a holy, holy, amazing, perfect God and making sure we are right. And if we're not right, begging God to change our hearts. That's what you can do. Even if you're not humble at this moment right now, you can beg God to help him to make you humble. And it can happen. But if you don't do it, you show you don't want it. Thereby rejecting God. Verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. Oh, this is it. Rejoicing. Okay. These men just got beat. Okay. You know what this made me do when I read this? It made me reflect on my life. The times where I've done, you know, not done things for God in that sense, but, you know, believing it was God did certain things and complained about the smallest thing. Oh, God, I gave this up. Or I'm, I'm, I'm giving a certain amount. I think I shared that story on Wednesday when I, at that one point where I was giving a lot of money and it was, it was struggling. And I went to Vanessa and was like, yo, like, what's up? I've been giving all this money. We've been giving all this money, giving to God like he says, and nothing is happening. If anything, we're way off than we were before. And she checked me. But my point is, is I was, right, I was real down too. I was real down. It lasted longer than a day. And that was because I didn't have enough money to, to, get, a, to get, I don't know, Chick-fil-A. Like, I'm, I'm serious, though, right? It's not even funny, because to me, it's not funny when I thought about it. It's not funny at all. And it's the same thing that we should be asking ourselves, the little that costs us in this country, and we complain about. Yet these men were beaten, could have had their life taken, and it says they were rejoicing. They didn't just come out and were good. They were rejoicing. Why? Because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Listen. People that don't know God cannot be counted worthy for suffering for the name. Why? Because they don't know him, right? But they were counted worthy, meaning something that the world looks at as so negative, not only did they accept it, but they viewed it as something that was an honor. It was an honor to be beaten in the name of Jesus. Do we have that? That heart, that's why I've been broken this week, amongst a few other things. Seriously, the things that I complain about, even in this transition, horrible attitude, horrible. And what am I, like, I'm not, I'm sorry, Liz, I'm not, you know, I, sometimes, I, if you know me, my heart really is bent on doing missions. I would love to be in a village somewhere where people don't know Jesus and live my life with them. I don't, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And God probably knows I'm not ready for that. Because the way I act here in land of the everything, I am not doing well. But these men were rejoicing. And I, I'm, I'm saying things from my life to say I admire these men. And I want to be like them. Verse 42. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching. Peep that. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house. So what does that mean? It wasn't just church. They left church, temple courts, and they went people's homes and still preached. So as we close out, right, the one thing that stood out to me and this may not be the same for all of you, right? I, I, I think I'm not a pastor at all, right? But Pastor Tony has been. We know Pastor Dan has one. 
I think one of the hardest things that a pastor has, right, is trying to preach a sermon and, and getting before God because you're hoping that in that sermon everybody is spoken to, right? I definitely believe that's like one of the most challenging things for somebody who gets up here and does it because of the way we, our structure is set up, right? So I don't believe what I'm about to say is for maybe every single person. But I do believe that it's for some of us as it ministered to me, right? This chapter was filled with unbelief, right? Unbelief on a believer's part, unbelief from the believers, I mean from non-believers. And to me, faith, like faith was resounding in me. And we know that in Hebrews it says it's impossible to please God without faith. And when you see in the middle of that chapter, that small portion where the apostles were still healing many, that people still had faith. They brought family members and they brought people and they prayed over them. And, well, I don't know if they prayed over them, but shadows were falling and they were healed. So that's what we do know, which is crazy. But the point is, is that I want to pray for us that, man, our faith would be restored. That some of us, and, and what does that look like? That means that when you walk away from church, you do the things God tells you to do. That's having faith. That's saying, I'm going to get before God because I know that in order to read and pray, that's faith. That God is going to hear me and change me. I'm going to witness to people because that's faith. I'm going to do things differently in my life because that's faith. It's almost like getting back to the fundamentals. You know, you can't play in a basketball game if you don't know how to dribble, if you don't know how to shoot the ball. You know, and God, the premise of our, of, of our walk is faith. It's believing that I'm doing this even though I don't see, remember, I don't see the outcome. I don't even know if this is going to change me. But God said it, so I'm going to try to make sure that I submit this body to believing that by doing something. So let's stand, please. I don't need 